Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for Ask Baycare Clinic, our Facebook Live discussion series. Today, we'll discuss aneurysms and hemorrhagic strokes. We're joined today by Dr. Gerald Eckert. He's a neurosurgeon with Baycare Clinic Neurological Surgeons. Uh, thank you for joining us, doctor. My pleasure, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's always a pleasure to, to chat with you. Uh, we want to remind everyone that while we're taking uh, live questions today, this is your time to interact with our specialists. Uh, if you have questions about aneurysms, if you have questions about hemorrhagic stroke, um, we encourage you to ask them in the comments section. We'll incorporate your questions into our live conversation today uh, and answer them in real time. If we do run out of time before we get to your question, uh, we'll respond to your question online after our live broadcast ends. Uh, and if you don't have a question, but you're just enjoying the conversation, uh, let us know by uh, uh, giving us a thumbs up, you know, give us a like, and let us know that you're just following along. We really appreciate that. Uh, having said all that, uh, let's get started. Uh, this is gonna be a, a, a good conversation here. Dr. Eckert, May is Stroke Awareness Month. Uh, it's the perfect time for us to hold this discussion about aneurysms and hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, let's start with some of the basics. Uh, first off, what is a stroke? So a stroke can be defined in really two different categories that um, can be defined as a blockage of a blood vessel or damage to a blood vessel causing bleeding within the brain itself or to the blood vessels leading to the brain as well. Okay, so then uh, what's a hemorrhagic stroke? So taking the, the word itself, you know, hemorrhagic means bleeding. So a hemorrhagic stroke is actually a type of stroke where there is bleeding inside the brain from one of the blood vessels in the brain. Okay. These types of strokes, hemorrhagic, uh, account for about 15% of all strokes, but are among the most life-threatening of stroke types. What is it about this type of stroke that makes it so dangerous? So the, the difference between hemorrhagic and the other type of strokes is that with a hemorrhagic stroke, there is active bleeding that occurs inside the brain and inside the skull. And keep in mind that the skull is like a box and there's only so much room inside the box. So depending on how large the bleed is sure. and in what location the bleed is, then it can become much more dangerous much more quickly. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I understand there's another form of stroke that is much more common. Um, what's that called and what happens uh, during this other variation of stroke? Right. So the other type of stroke is, is uh, called an ischemic stroke. And what that basically means in comparison to a bleed in the brain, that is a blockage inside the vessels that lead and provide blood supply to the brain itself. Okay. Um, what are the risk factors for stroke? So risk factors, and since we have those two different types, yeah. um, concerning the more common, the ischemic type of stroke, you know, typically we think of problems with diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, changes in the, the heart itself that causes different rhythms of the heart, um, and then also high blood pressure, if I didn't say that already, smoking, and then, um, let's see here, something else. I'm sorry, Femi. So hypertension, diabetes, right. heart disease, and then smoking, right. decreased activity, obesity is obesity. also another one as well. That's, that's probably the one you missed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about Be Fast. It's the acronym that we want viewers uh, to remember when it comes to stroke. What is, what is this Be Fast about? Sure. So the acronym, and I'll break it down. So B stands for balance problems. Um, e stands for eyes or vision problems. Mm -hmm. F stands for facial weakness or facial droop. Droop, yep. A stands for arm or leg weakness. And then S stands for speech difficulty. And then T stands for terrible headache and also time. Okay. Um, that leads us right into uh, my next question, uh, time. Why is it important to dial 911 
in a timely manner if you suspect someone near you might be having a stroke? Yeah, so with stroke, time is everything, from particularly with the ischemic type of stroke, but also very important in the hemorrhagic type as well. And the reason why it's so much better to call 911 to have the ambulance and the EMT show up is because that will give us at the hospital forewarning that a patient who is having a potential stroke is on the way and that we'll be prepared to move as quickly as possible once that patient arrives in lieu of trying to start the process when the patient hits the door with a walk-in type of a visit, whereas the ambulance can call ahead and say, right. hey, be ready. We may have a, a pretty you know, significant stroke coming in. Right, right. Um, we already have some comments coming in, which is good. Please keep them coming. Um, so somebody's asking, um, how does working with the stroke team during such incidents impact the care of patients? Yeah. It's an excellent question. So one of the things that's a benefit about working at a comprehensive stroke center is that the team in the ER, the team in radiology, the ICU team, the interventionist, myself and my colleague, the therapists, the rehab physicians that come and help, they're all geared toward taking care of those stroke patients. And so teamwork is a very important part, both initially when the patient reaches the emergency department from coordinating the care from the emergency room providers to the radiologist, to reading the CAT scan, right. to the nurses, to the techs, you name it all the way through the end, no matter what type of treatment it is, to the rehab side of things as well. So there is coordination, coordination, coordination with the goal to be the best possible outcome for each of those patients. Okay, good, good. Um, we, we have a, a let's see, I have another question related to hemorrhagic strokes. Um, do hemorrhagic strokes and ischemic strokes present the same symptoms, um, alerting you to the fact that a stroke is occurring? So they, they certainly can uh, present with similar symptoms and everything depends upon where the hemorrhage or where the blockage is in the brain and which blood vessel it is affecting. Um, some of the symptoms that we described with the BFAST can certainly be caused by either a hemorrhagic stroke or an ischemic stroke. So you have to be ready and prepared to treat each of those with every patient that comes through the door. Okay. Okay. Um, so we're, we're talking about stroke and aneurysm. So a quick clarification on what an aneurysm is. Um, what is it? And what does that have to do with stroke? So an aneurysm is a small outpouching or weakness in the wall of one of the normal blood vessels, either outside or inside the brain itself. Uh -huh. And because that area of the blood vessel is weak, that can lead, if it ruptures, to a hemorrhagic type of stroke. Okay. Okay, well, thanks for the information, doctor. Let's do a little housekeeping here. If you're just joining us, we're discussing aneurysms and hemorrhagic strokes with Dr. Gerald Ecker. Uh, he's a neurosurgeon with Baker Clinic Neurological Surgeon. Uh, today's discussion is part of our Facebook Live discussion series. Feel free to ask your aneurysm and stroke questions in the comments section. We'll incorporate those questions into our discussion today and we'll answer them in real time. At least we'll do our best to do so. And if we don't answer your question in real time, <clears throat> rest assured that we'll respond to your questions online at the conclusion of today's live stream. Um, and you know, if you don't have questions, but you're enjoying the conversation, you're enjoying the information, go ahead and give us a thumbs up to let us know that you're following along. We'd, we'd appreciate that. All right, let's keep the conversation moving. Um, you just defined for us an aneurysm and its connection to stroke. Um, how is an aneurysm diagnosed? So an aneurysm is diagnosed uh, typically with a imaging study, either a CT or an MRI to take a look at the blood vessels in the brain. And it's not uncommon that these are found when we get scans for other reasons. Okay. Okay. So that sounds like people don't always know that they have a, an aneurysm. 
That is correct. It's it's very, very common that we find and we have, we see patients with what we call incidentally diagnosed, meaning they have found to have an aneurysm that was not previously known because a study of your brain was done and lo and behold, there's an aneurysm there. And then you come see someone like myself or my colleague. Right, right. So are there, you know, common symptoms or warning signs that a, a person might have an aneurysm? So when I, when I talk to patients about aneurysms, so things that, that typically come up are certainly family history. If there's a family history or a known history in your family of brain bleeds or known history of aneurysms, then those relatives will have a higher risk or thought to have a higher risk for developing aneurysms. Okay. Certainly uh, personal risk as well. Okay. People with high blood pressure, people who smoke, uh, and then also people with some other type of genetic disorders that are very rare are the people that most commonly present or have aneurysms. Okay. We do have a question related to aneurysm. Somebody is asking if it's normal to have sensitivity at the site of a craniotomy that never goes away af after having two aneurysms clipped. It's quite the specific question. <laughs> Yes, yes, it is. Um, so it's it's certainly not uncommon at all to have sensitivity at a craniotomy site. And just for clarification, craniotomy is when you perform right. surgery, open surgery for an aneurysm. There's an incision made in the skin, and then a portion of the bone of the skull is removed in order to access where the aneurysms are inside the brain and around the brain. Um, and then obviously the bone goes back on. There's different ways to attach the bone. Um, typically it's with tiny little screws and plates. And then obviously the incision is closed on the skin. But again, there's gonna be scar tissue there. Those sure. plates are gonna be underneath the skin. So um, it sounds like this patient unfortunately has an unusual occurrence that it has persisted for so long, but it's not uncommon that I have patients that have those similar complaints. Okay, okay. Uh, another question. Um, Somebody's kind of commenting that um, they overheat easily uh, while working inside or, or outside since having uh, aneurysms clipped. Um, this person wants to know it, what causes that. Is that something you've heard of, something you've dealt with before? And I'll be honest, that's not a complaint that I've routinely heard in okay. the aneurysm patients that I've treated. So. Okay. Uh, I guess it just goes to show that uh, you always hear about new things from individuals and I'd be very interested for that patient to kind of get their story as far as where the aneurysm was and right. the specifics of that. All right, let's, let's uh, take one more and then we'll kind of um, jump back to our questions here. Um, somebody's asking why women are more likely to have a ruptured brain aneurysm than men. I wasn't aware that was a that was the case. Uh, is that the case? So with that, um, you know, and, and thinking in my practice here, I'm trying to think if we do see a higher propensity of women with ruptured aneurysms. Um, you know, certainly there are other diagnoses where women are more common to have than men. Um, but I would say, at least in my practice, I haven't seen a specific predilection for women for aneurysms right. over men. Okay. All right. Good. Good. I know it's uh, it's tough to answer some of these uh, you know unscripted questions or whatever, but but that's what that's live broadcasting for you. Yeah. So let's keep going. Um, so does an unruptured aneurysm always need to be treated? No, uh, not all unruptured aneurysms need to be treated. So when a patient comes in to talk about a newly diagnosed aneurysm, there is a discussion of treatment versus observation. And there's always trying to figure out which one carries the least amount of risk for that patient. So aneurysms with certain um, characteristics that are very small, that are in a location where we know that there is a lower risk for rupture, those aneurysms we typically tend to watch and re-image over time and watch them to make sure that they don't grow. Mm -hmm. Whereas other aneurysms that are thought to be larger or demonstrate more evidence of risky, be it uh, risky 
size, risky shape, other risk factors that we discussed previously, then those will, will uh, trend towards treatment. Okay. So if a patient experiences a ruptured aneurysm, does that always result in immediate treatment? Does that person have to be treated pronto? So when anyone has a ruptured aneurysm, the preference is to treat as soon as possible. And the reason for that is, is because the risk of that aneurysm bleeding again and causing further damage is highest within the first several days after that aneurysm is ruptured. So all aneurysms that are ruptured, the first choice should be to treat them okay. as soon as possible. Okay. Say you determine an unruptured aneurysm does need treatment, like it's it's time to do something about this. Um, how is that usually treated? So two different options are available for treatment of intracranial aneurysms. And um, as things evolved over the past many years, it went from the majority of aneurysms being treated with open surgery, similar to that previous question with the craniotomy. Mm -hmm. and now the vast minority are treated with open surgery. And the majority of those aneurysms are treated actually from inside the blood vessels through what we call endovascular or inside the vessel techniques with coils, with stents, with other new devices that are coming out to actually close the balloon from the inside of the vessel. Okay, okay. Um, so when an aneurysm has ruptured, um, is that any different than treating one that hasn't ruptured? In so, terms of the, the process. Right, right. Um, aside from the timing, um, the only thing that changes is the vast majority of aneurysms that are ruptured are treated endovascularly. Okay. And outcomes, several studies have shown that that has better outcomes long term. Um, and there are some small changes that I do differently between a ruptured aneurysm and an elective aneurysm as far as how I would go about with my planning and my treatment of that. But with the goal being obviously to get the aneurysm treated and close so that risk of bleeding is less. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk, you know, post treatment. Um, is there an extended, you know, hospital stay um, either for ruptured or, or unruptured, uh, you know, once they're treated or is this patient just up and at them the next day and Right. See you when I see you? Like, how does that go? Sure. So dividing up between the ruptured aneurysms and the unruptured aneurysms, um, unruptured aneurysms treated endovascularly through the artery. Typically, it's an overnight stay and they're home okay. the next day. Okay. Um, with the craniotomy, then it's a couple of days in okay. the hospital at least. Now, compare that to a ruptured aneurysm, patients in the hospital for a couple of weeks. And the reason for that is there are many other things that can happen in the following several days to weeks after an aneurysm is ruptured that are risky that we have to carefully monitor that patient for. Okay. Uh, there's another question that came in. Um, what are the chances someone is living with an unknown aneurysm? That's actually a very good question. Yes, that is. Uh, and the exact percentage of people that are in the nation or in the populace with an unruptured aneurysm. Right. That number is escaping me, of course. Okay. Is it high? <laughs> is it low? It's low. It's okay. not, it's not a high number. Uh, it's a low number. And uh, I apologize. I can't spit that number out exactly yeah. for you, um, but it's certainly a low number. And the number of patients, again, that, we go on to treatment or have subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is the type of bleed from an aneurysm, um, that type of hemorrhagic stroke, again, is rare. So okay. it's not the vast majority of people walking around that have an aneurysm. Right. So generally speaking, I can go to bed peacefully tonight, not worrying about having an aneurysm. Correct. Okay. I, cer I certainly do, Femi. Okay. So. <laughs> Great, great. Well, let's pivot a little bit and talk more about hemorrhagic strokes again. Sure. Um, do people experience pain with stroke? Uh, they certainly can. You know, one of the leading presentations 
or I'm sorry, not leading, but one of the most common initial presentations, particularly for a hemorrhagic stroke is headache. Because of that reason with the bleed in the brain, as we talked about before, mm -hmm. only so much space, any more, any more space or any more volume inside that is gonna cause a headache. So that is probably the most common thing that we see coming in for patients that have had a hemorrhagic stroke is headache. Okay, if a person has experienced a stroke, are chances high that they can recover and, you know, be fine as they were before experiencing stroke? Right. Is it case by case, person by person? It, it's certainly a case by case and everything depends upon, again, the location, uh, what vessel is involved from a hemorrhagic standpoint, the size of the hemorrhage, again, the location of the hemorrhage, uh, and then also on the ischemic side, again, what blood vessel is involved. And then also, very importantly, how quickly you come in for treatment. Uh, oh, from the ischemic good. side of strokes, the availability of different types of treatment for that and the outcomes for that are much better if people come in as soon as possible. And then, uh, but to answer your question very briefly, it varies. Yes. It varies. Do we see people that make complete recoveries? We absolutely do. Right. Uh, is that a possibility? It is. Okay. But again, it's, it's on a case by case basis based sure. on what people are with. Sure. The the questions keep rolling in, so if you don't mind, we'll, we'll ask another. We'll ask you another sure. submitted question. Um, if you have had a hemorrhagic stroke, what are the chances of it happening again? So the and it all depends again on the cause of the stroke. After someone has had a stroke, the most important thing is obviously to treat them immediately, but then beyond that is to try and determine what was the cause and how do we prevent that going forward. So if we can accurately diagnose the reason behind the stroke that you had, then everything goes towards preventing a further one, or I'm sorry, a future stroke right. after that initial stroke. Right, and that makes sense. Yeah. Um, another question, are, are there any non-classic stroke symptoms that, you know, surprised you at some point in time? Um, if so, what were they? Uh, hiccups. <laughs> oh. Hiccups is one, and that's a very specific um, area in the back part of the brain where you can have hiccups. Um, okay. You know, problems, uh, very subtle findings with vision. Um, mm -hmm. even just a little bit of double vision, little things such as that. And the problem with stroke is if you think about everything that your body does, the brain controls. All right. Of and you can have little tiny areas of stroke that produce some very interesting symptoms that are very uncommon. So as I, as I try and remind myself, you know, what's common is common. So the common symptoms that we describe with the BFAST and those other um, acronyms out there right. kind of describe the vast majority of what we see, but there are those very unique and non-classic ones that we'll see. Right. That's why you have to really kind of think about how the patient comes in and think about from, you know, from a physician standpoint and the brain standpoint, what could lead to these symptoms to try and help you lead to what the problem is. So okay. yes, there are, and, and we do see them. Okay, great. Um, aren't strokes mostly seen in the elderly population? I mean, should should younger folks even be remotely concerned about stroke? Uh, so certainly the, the majority of people that do have strokes are elderly. But that being said, stroke affects every age range, every age range. So I've certainly treated people, hemorrhagic strokes mm -hmm. in children for different reasons. Oh, I'm sure. Um, and also ischemic strokes in young people as well that have a genetic predisposition to forming blood clots. So, and another thing too, when you think about the risk factors that we discussed earlier for stroke, right? You know, high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes. If you see those in younger populations, you're going to see a higher level of stroke in younger patients as well. So okay. stroke affects all ages. Um, the best that we can do is just monitor those risk factors and do what we can. Great, great. Um, why don't some patients recognize um, stroke symptoms, their own stroke symptoms? Right. And 
I, I think a part of it, and, and that's probably the biggest thing that we try and do is, is education, making sure that the education is out there to understand and be able to identify those symptoms that are consistent with stroke. Um, so education, I think, is one to making sure that many people as we possibly can understand the symptoms to look for. But again, going back to that question from that very astute person, some symptoms are very subtle and they may not see them right away or right. they can mimic other things. Right. Headaches are very common. Not every headache is a bleed in the brain. Right. So it can be difficult and if they're subtle, then they can, they can linger for a while before the accurate diagnosis is made. Okay. There, there is a question that came in. Um, I don't know what you know about Ellie's Law. Does that ring a bell with you? Ellie's Law. Ellie's mm -hmm. Law. So what would the passing of Ellie's Law do for you individually as well as your practice at Baycare Clinic? Oh, boy. Is that I, one I, that we can, we can answer? Yeah, I, I'll have to look that up. I, I'm not yeah. familiar with Ellie's Law, but when okay. I look it up, I'd be happy to answer it. Yeah, let's let's do that. Thank you for the question, though. Um, okay, uh, reader, reiterate for us: What should a bystander do if they suspect a person near them might be having a stroke? So again, going back to the the B fast symptoms that are consistent with a stroke, the most important thing is time. Mm -hmm. The quickest way to get people involved in the care of that stroke. It's going to be to call 911 and get the emergency responders on their way to get that patient to the emergency room as soon as possible. Yeah, and tell us again why time is of the essence when you suspect somebody's having a stroke. Right. So when time is of the essence, we mean by that that some of the treatments that we have available to us have a definitive time frame from the onset of symptoms. So whenever those symptoms start, that talk, the clock is ticking, and some of the options that we have, particularly with the blood clots or the ischemic strokes, giving medications, a clot busting medication has a certain time frame, And then also any of the endovascular treatments to open blood vessels, the sooner that patient comes in, the better chance they are gonna have a better outcome with removing the clot. Okay, okay. Um, so kind of talk again about what we can do to reduce our risk of stroke? Yeah, so I, I go back to you know the risk factors, the genetic things we talked about. Can't change our genetics. That's what we right. have. You know, that's right. what we're born with. That's what we live with. But looking at those risk factors personally, you know, do you have diabetes? Do you have high blood pressure? Do you smoke? Do you exercise? Do you go to your primary care physician to get checked out on an annual basis? I'll admit, family, I didn't do that for a long time. <laughs> so, you know, making sure that your risk factors, correct, you know, making sure that your risk factors are as low as you can possibly make them. Right. You know, watch your weight. Make sure your diabetes is controlled. Make sure your blood pressure is controlled. Don't smoke. See your primary care provider on a regular basis. Right. Those are things that we can do to, to decrease your risk of stroke. Right. Do those uh, also apply to aneurysm or are there other things we can do to reduce our risk of aneurysm? So again, the genetic thing we can't change, but mm -hmm. being aware of that and being cognizant of that is important. Um, so from the genetic standpoint, that does play a little bit more of a role, I believe, with the aneurysm side of things because direct relatives, then we treat them a little bit differently with aneurysms. But again, smoking, hypertension, those right. things are things that we can change and things that we can control. Right. I'll ask this, this recent question. Um, what's your favorite surgery to perform? Somebody's asking. Uh, all right. Uh, so, uh, you know, being a blood vessel guy, my, my right. favorite surgery to perform is actually an open craniotomy for an aneurysm clip. Wow. Um, I, I, I just love the one seeing the brain working with the blood vessels and just how intricate the surgery is and how delicate the surgery is. It just requires me to be perfect. And I, and I, sh I shoot for perfection every time I operate, but you know, I think that one is the one that I, I just enjoy the most. Hence the reason I kind of deal with aneurysms and strokes. Right. <laughs> it, I, I'm excited about it. it, it, it just, I can tell. <laughs> yeah. It makes me excited. So. Good. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. 
Well, thank you, Dr. Eckert. Uh, can you leave us with a solid message for Stroke Awareness Month? It's something you want people to carry with them, not just for Stroke Awareness Month, but for the remainder of the year. Sure. Um, don't be afraid to come in. Um, if you're concerned or if you see someone that may have any of these symptoms that we were describing, even if you're not that concerned about it, it's always better to come in and get checked out. We're here all the time, 24 seven. We're here to help. It's better to come in and get checked out in a little missing something. Right, right. Well, thank you. You're off the hot seat. <laughs> Excellent information today. Uh, Dr. Ecker, thank you for spending time with us today. We really appreciate it. And thank you everyone for joining in. The questions were, were amazing today. Thank you so much. Uh, to be alerted about live content from uh, Baker Clinic, be sure to like us on Facebook and click the bell icon to subscribe. If you have additional questions, please feel free to keep them coming. Uh, ask them in the comments section. We will get to them even after uh, this live stream has ended. Uh, if you want to learn more about Baycare Clinic, please visit baycare.net. Uh, thanks for joining us and have a great day.